Hello and welcome to New Milton Baptist Church as we gather in the name of Jesus to worship God. The reading is taken from Exodus chapter 23. So hear the word of God. Three times a year you are to celebrate a festival to me. Celebrate the festival of unleavened bread. For seven days eat bread made without yeast as I commanded you. Do this at the appointed time in the month of Aviv, for in that month you came out of Egypt. No one is to appear before me empty-handed. Celebrate the festival of harvest with the first fruits of the crops you sow in your field. Celebrate the festival of ingathering at the end of the year when you gather in the cro the, your crops from the field. Three times a year, all the men are to appear before the Sovereign Lord. May God bless his word to us this morning. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word from all those years ago. Your word that speaks to us down the centuries and is just as relevant to us today. Your command that we appear before you. And this morning we come in the name of Jesus to worship you. We can't gather physically, but by various means we come together in his name to worship, to honour and to magnify your holy name. And Father, we ask that as we come together, you would grant to us a spirit of unity. That you would inhabit our praises, that we might worship you in spirit and in truth. And Father, we ask that by your spirit you would speak into our lives. That each one of us might be challenged, encouraged and drawn ever closer to you. Father, as we enter the presence of one who is absolutely holy, we recognise that we have thought, said and done things that we shouldn't. So as we approach your glorious throne, so we come confessing our sins. We cannot and would not conceal anything from you, for your searching gaze sees all. But we come confessing our sins to you. Confessing in gratitude, because true to your word, you will forgive, cleanse and renew. And we would have nothing to prevent us seeking your face this morning. So guide our worship, we pray, Speak into our lives, that our lives might glorify you. In Jesus' name, Amen. Our main reading is taken from Luke chapter 2 and reading from verse 41. Now this is a continuation from the birth narrative of Jesus. And this is the occasion in his adolescence when he and his family went up to the temple in Jerusalem to worship. So reading from Luke chapter 2 and verse 41. Every year Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. When he was 12 years old they went up to the festival according to the custom. After the festival was over while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they travelled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him 
was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me? he asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with it with them, and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature, and in favour with God and man. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for that word. We ask that you would breathe it into our lives, grant us understanding, and I ask that you would fill me with your spirit, that I might speak your word in truth. Have your way amongst us, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. In the Old Testament, God had commanded that all Jewish men had to appear before him. For three key festivals, they had to come to the temple to worship. And each of those three festivals focused on what God had done for them, his love, his provision. And Joseph and Mary were faithful Jews. The men were commanded to go and worship. But Mary went as well. Every year they went to the temple to worship, travelling all the way from Nazareth up in Galilee to Jerusalem in Judea, and that was several days' journey. On this particular occasion, Jesus was 12 years old, and they went up to the festival according to the custom. Every word in the Bible is there for a reason. Paper, parchment and ink were expensive, so only that which was important was written down. Luke tells us that Jesus was 12 years old, he was still a child. The age of religious responsibility was 13, so he hadn't even reached that. That year, Instruction in the scriptures would have become more intense, and Jesus hadn't reached that. Joseph, Mary and Jesus went up to Jerusalem for the Passover. They were in a large group with family, friends and neighbours. And then, when the festival was over, they all set off for home. It was a safe environment, so they weren't worried about the boy, Jesus. They thought he was with some of the other children, with friends or relatives. But after a day's journey, he hadn't appeared. So they began looking for him. And when they didn't find him among their company, Joseph and Mary returned to Jerusalem and spent three days searching the city for him. Well, after three days, they found Jesus in the temple, at 12 years old, sitting among the teachers, literally in the midst of the teachers. Now the temple was not just a place of sacrifice. It was the top seat of learning for Judaism. All the top scholars, the elder theologians and the Bible experts were there. And here is Jesus, at 12 years old, in the midst of the experts, astounding them with his understanding and knowledge. There he was, 12 years old, probing them with questions and amazing them with his answers to their questions. This was no ordinary boy. Now it's highly likely that Luke got his information about, about this occasion from Jesus' mother Mary direct. Remember that the introduction to this gospel says that Luke carefully investigated everything from the beginning. 
so that we might know the truth, the certainty about these events. Luke wants us to know that these things really happened. They're not just fables. This is the truth. And this event clearly had a big effect on Mary because we're told that she treasured all these things in her heart. So at 12 years old, Jesus was unique. Everyone who heard was amazed at his understanding, verse 47. This was no ordinary 12 year old. Even as an early adolescent, he had an inherent authority. He astounded the scholars, and when his parents found him in the temple, after three days searching through Jerusalem, they too were astounded. He was an obedient child, and yet here he seemed to have misbehaved. So Mary said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. In the beginning, the angel had told her that she would bear the Son of God, that she'd been chosen to raise him. And in this instance, she wasn't prepared for all that this would entail. Jesus couldn't understand their anxiety. Why were you searching for me, he asked. Didn't you realise that I had to be in my father's house? Being the Son of God, they perhaps should have realised that he would be in the house of God. Mary had said, your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. By father, Mary meant Joseph, Jesus' stepfather. Now Jesus' response reveals a great deal. Mary called his father Joseph. Her husband. When Jesus said, I had to be in my father's house, and we'll come back to that phrase in a moment, he fully understood who his father was. Joseph was his stepfather. His actual father was God himself. Jesus was and is God, conceived by the Holy Spirit, the second person of the Godhead who had entered Mary's womb. He had taken on human flesh to be born as we are, to be a baby as we have been, vulnerable and helpless. He had grown through being a toddler to be a child. And now here in this passage, we see him as an adolescent, as an adolescent experiencing life just as we do. But even then, though he'd emptied himself of all his glory and his majesty, he was still well aware of his identity. Jesus knew exactly who he was. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? Verse 49. And the wording for that phrase is a little unclear. The literal translation of the original Greek says this, it says, I must be about the of my father. So it's a little problematic. And here they've rendered it, I had to be in my father's house. But I think it could be just as, as well put as I had to be about my father's business. He had to be about the business of his father doing God's work, even at 12 years old. And part of his father's business was the scriptures. The Bible is the word of God. It's there to reveal God to us. And as God made flesh, Jesus is the author. Remember Paul says in 2 Timothy, all scripture is God breathed. All the Bible is the Word of God, not just inspired, but God breathed. And as God, Jesus is the absolute authority on his own Word. And in this passage, 
Jesus showed his authority in the way he probed and answered the Bible experts in the temple. He astounded them by his understanding. Here we see his authority. Here we get a glimpse of Jesus' identity. He had to be about his father's business. And his business was to teach the truth. As his ministry on earth took off, people were amazed at his authority. His teaching cut through the traditions of men and got to the heart of what the scriptures are about. In calling God his father, remember, he had to be in his father's house or he had to be about his father's business. Jesus was doing something that no other devout Jew would have done. Later on, the people would try to kill him because he called God his father. And you can find that in John chapter 5. Even as a 12-year-old, Jesus had an amazing intimacy with God his father. As God, Jesus was in, per in perfect communion with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. He knew what his father's business was. He knew what he had to be doing. His intimacy with God the Father was unprecedented. No one else had or could claim that. His intimacy with the Father, his deep personal knowledge of God enabled him to hold his own and astonish even the most educated of the scholars of his day. He had to be about his father's business. And his father's business is that all humanity could enter into that same intimacy with God that he had. Jesus came to be about his father's business, to be our teacher and our example to show us how to live, to show us what it is to be in relationship with God. But more than that, he came to make that possible. Jesus taught the scriptures, opening up their real meaning, but he also fulfilled those same scriptures. The entire Old Testament points us to Jesus, even telling us what he would do. Isaiah 53, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Jesus came to bring us back to God, to make intimacy between us and our Creator possible. Further on, Isaiah says, we all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his or her own way. None of us is perfect. Each and every one of us has fallen short in some way. The fact that we're not perfect, the fact that we're sinners, makes intimacy with God impossible. Our sins have hidden his face from us. That's in Isaiah 59. But Jesus came not only to demonstrate this intimacy, he came to make it possible. Because the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Such is the love of God for you and for me. Jesus, God made flesh, not only came to earth to be our example, he was born in Bethlehem, he grew up to adulthood, and when his ministry on earth had been fulfilled, it culminated in his death on the cross. He told us the truth, the truth about us, the truth about God, truth about himself. But people cannot handle the truth. 
he surrendered himself to the hands of evil men, giving himself to be crucified for us. All our iniquity, our sin, our imperfection was laid on him. And Jesus' death has bought our forgiveness. His death and resurrection have made intimacy with God possible. And for all who will believe, for all who commit themselves to him, for all who will accept Jesus as Lord of their lives, were accepted and forgiven by God. And that moment that we do commit, we're born of the Holy Spirit and we can enter into that intimacy of relationship with God that he came to bring us and that he offers to us today. God loves us. God loves you. And he's been reaching out to you and to me all the days of our lives. He knows us intimately and he wants us to know him. Not just to know about him, but to know him personally. God desires intimacy with you. To know him, to be in relationship with him. He loves us, he loves you, and the depth of his love is to be seen in Jesus. Born as a babe in Bethlehem, here we see him at 12 years old in Jerusalem, but he would grow to maturity, and out of love for you and for me, he would offer himself on the cross our place. How great is the love of God for you and for me. There's no wonder that Mary treasured these things in our heart. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this glimpse into Jesus as an adolescent. Very much God very much human, God made flesh. We thank you that he came to experience life as we do, to experience all the trials and sufferings of life, but to come through victorious and give his life that we might come to you. Father, receive our thanks and our praise as we commit ourselves into your almighty hands afresh. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now I'm going to read a hymn to you. It's a modern hymn. You can find it in Mission Praise. It's written by Stuart Townend. From the squalor of a borrowed stable, by the spirit and a virgin's faith, to the anguish and the shame of scandal came the saviour of the human race. But the skies were filled with the praise of heaven. Shepherds listen as the angels tell of the gift of God come down to man at the dawning of Emmanuel. King of heaven, now the friend of sinners, humble servant in the Father's hand, filled with power and the Holy Spirit, Filled with mercy for the broken man. Yes, he walked my road and he felt my pain, joys and sorrows that I know so well. Yet his righteous steps give me hope again. I will follow my Emmanuel. Through the kisses of a friend's betrayal, he was lifted on a cruel cross. He was punished for a world's transgressions. He was suffering to save the lost. He fights for breath, he fights for me, loosing sinners from the claims of hell. And with a shout, our souls are free, death defeated by Emmanuel. Now he's standing at the place of honour, 
crowned with glory on the highest throne, interceding for his own beloved till his father calls to bring them home. Then the skies will part as the trumpet sounds, hope of heaven or the fear of hell, but the bride will run to her lover's arms, giving glory to Emmanuel. And Emmanuel means God with us. Now let's bring our prayers for others. Let's pray. Father God, we praise you. We praise you that you have sent Jesus as our Emmanuel. God with us so that we can be with you. Now as we bring our prayers and our petitions to you, because of Jesus, we know that you will hear us and respond. And so, Father, we come humbly and in faith. And as this, as this country has now entered a new lockdown, so we pray for the people of this land. We pray against this new variant of the COVID virus. We pray that you will please stop its spread, that people will take this lockdown seriously, that we will stay within our families and our bubbles, that we won't take risks. Father, we pray that you would protect those that we love and we bear them in our, in our minds before you now, asking that you protect and keep them and bring them safely through this time. We pray for the successful rollout of this vaccine, that these vaccines might be available, that there might be enough people to inoculate the people of this country, that all those who are vulnerable might have it, might develop an immunity that we might see this disease eradicated. Father, we bow before you and we ask that you be merciful to us for this land deserves nothing from you. As a people, we've turned our backs on you. And Father, we pray that you be merciful to this land, both in terms of the eradication of this disease, but even more, that you would bring this, this land back to you. Father, we pray that you would silence the voices of those who would, who would not have the name of Jesus mentioned, those who would keep religion out of the public sphere, that all might hear the name of Jesus and know that he died for them, that all might be given the opportunity to come to you to receive him as Lord and Saviour, that this land might return to the God who loves us and gave Jesus for us. We pray that you will revive your church in every part, breathe new life into us, that we might fulfil the commission that you've given, that we share our faith with others and make disciples of all nations beginning here with ourselves. We pray for our government, for our Prime Minister Boris Johnson, for the Ministers of the Crown, for each and every MP. And Father, we ask that you would cause them to work together for the good of all. We pray that no one will use cheap political capital to undermine or to cause any damage to, to all that's needed to be done, that there might be unity of purpose and unity of spirit among the politicians for once. And we pray for our Queen, we thank you for her, that she un unashamedly names the name of Jesus as her Saviour and her Lord. And Father, we ask that you would guide her to advise, to warn and to encourage her ministers. 
Father, we pray for this country in every part, for this united kingdom. For that it, we ask that it would remain a united kingdom. That none of the different parts of the union will use the, the, the events around the COVID virus to make capital for separation. Father, we pray that you would bring this union together that we might be one nation. And Father, we ask that Jesus would be Lord in every part. And so we pray for all the politicians from all the parties that you would open their eyes especially to the fact that they're accountable to Jesus. That they don't just serve the electorate, but they govern under your authority. We ask that you would reveal yourself in their lives, that they might each be brought to repentance. And now, Father, we bring to you those people and situations that are on our hearts, and we bring them to you in the silence. So, Father, we bring to you all our prayers. We bring them in the name of Jesus, knowing that as we do, you will hear and you will answer, for you are always good to your word. So receive our thanks and our praise in the name of Jesus. And let's draw all our prayers together as we say the Lord's Prayer. Let's pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honour and glory for ever and ever. Amen. And may the blessing of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit rest on you be with you now and always. Amen. And God bless you.